Um, hi, everyone. Thanks very much for that introduction. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here with you today talking about the next generation of energy marketplaces um, and how this energy transition to um, a, a kind of low uh, or zero carbon world depends on it. Um, so what I've heard this morning is kind of quite a few different places people are coming here from. Um, we at Electron have the privilege of kind of getting to uh, sit on the bleeding edge. We are looking at uh, zero marginal cost markets, markets with really high penetration of wind and solar, and trying to work out what sort of marketplace and what sort of market design uh, enables that. Um, so uh, you heard this morning from Michael Liebrich about how uh, by 2040, 33% of generation is going to be zero marginal cost. It's going to be wind and solar. Um, but you also heard how that kind of 5 to 50% moves very fast. Now, it's not going to be kind of 33% across the board. It's going to be 50% in some markets, and it's going to be 5% in other markets. Um, so I'm going to uh, talk a bit about uh, what needs to change, uh, what the impediments for that change are, and how at Electron we're sort of beginning to navigate through that. And I don't know if anyone else here has noticed kind of a strange schizophrenia in kind of energy press recently that we need to call out. On the one hand, you've got this kind of um, optimistic exuberance of like technology. Um, and on the other hand, you've got this kind of grinding boredom, this kind of impasse of the fact that things aren't changing or scaling fast enough. On the kind of technological exuberance side, um, it feels like we finally have almost all of the capabilities we need to operate a, 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 a zero carbon grid. So in the UK, we're trying to move that by 2025. It's very soon. Um, and yet on the other hand, you've got this kind of frustration that we're still reading about trials. Every time someone installs a bigger battery, we read about it. Every time someone installs a grid scale battery, we read about it. These things aren't scaling yet or becoming mainstream. And uh, we think that is because the market uh, uh, places, the market design, remains inappropriate for these uh, uh, zero marginal cost generation. So what's got to change? Let's see if I can do that. Here we go. The first thing is this idea of the kind of the primacy of the megawatt hour. It's this kind of like fungible commodity. Almost every electricity, actually every electricity exchange today, that is the fundamental unit of account, the megawatt hour. Um, but there's a whole new value stack you need to think about uh, in a kind of uh, a, a market with a high penetration of wind and solar. Um, essentially, the megawatt hour is not a very good uh, 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 unit of value when you can uh, run at kind of near zero margins. Wind and solar plants aren't looking at those kind of price signals to decide whether to export or not. Um, but what does become much more value, all the other things around it. So for example, uh, time of uh, 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 production, really, really sharp time period. So in today's exchanges, you tend to kind of transact in 30 minute blocks. Whereas what's much, much more valuable is power at the exact moment that you need it. Um, so the next generation exchange is going to have to address that. Uh, it's going to have to look much more carefully at location, at where that power is produced. Because in um, most countries in Europe right now, we don't even have a locational price. We're sort of saying wherever power is generated, it's worth the same amount. Whereas we've got a lot of distribution connected assets. We've got a lot of kind of energy traffic jams, I call them. And so some power is not dispatchable. And clearly, non-dispatchable power is worth less than dispatchable power. You then got kind of a, a, a generation or, or, or power usage that helps relieve a constraint. That's worth a lot more than just normal power. So location has to come in a much sharper focus. And even in North America, where you have this kind of a, a regional or kind of locational marginal pricing, it has to be much, much more exact than a price for this kind of large town. We're going to have to get down to kind of transformer level in order for that to be valuable. And then there's all sorts of other things around how the power is produced. Like, what are the kind of byproducts of that power? Things like uh, inertia becoming increasingly important. We had a, uh, a blackout in London uh, on the 9th of August. That makes people change how markets are structured and, and, and incentivized very quickly. Um, VARs, like uh, 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 sort of local uh, 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 grid stability products, also become valuable. A lot of markets here don't exist yet. Some kind of clever guy in the dispatch room just knows if he dispatches that asset, he'll also get inertia. So we've got to start calling those prices out. 
who or what is producing power, increasingly valuable too. The sense of reliability, when I call on you, are you there? Someone reliable is worth more than someone who's not. Carbon intensity and all sorts of other things that we haven't thought about yet. So there's a whole new value stack in town that really, really uh, plays to the capabilities of distributed, uh, flexible energy resources, things like batteries. We've heard a lot about electric vehicles this morning. Um, and the challenging thing for them to kind of put together that value stack is uh, access to these markets, access to these price signals doesn't really exist yet on the one hand. And secondly, these flexible technologies can do a lot of these things at once. Some of them can do all of these things at once. Um, if you are uh, uh, you know, producing power at exactly the right time in exactly the right location with all the right kind of byproducts and, and, and what have you, you should be able to be uh, paid for all those things. Whereas right now, you're sort of in these bilateral one-to-one -one markets, and you're not able to make that revenue stack. Now, without being able to pay these guys the full value of what they're worth to the system, then you're not going to send very good investment price signals. And don't forget the consumer. This is a, a mistake that our industry makes a lot. We are still charging consumers fixed prices per kilowatt hour that they use. I just talked about how the kind of megawatt hour is becoming a less appropriate uh, 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 value mechanism. The kilowatt hour is sometimes worth it, and sometimes it's incredibly valuable. And yet we're still writing this kind of blanket option to consumers to use power whenever they want. And if that sounds good to you as a consumer, you're paying for that option. You might not even want to use it. So we need to move to a, a more cost-reflective pricing model where we're essentially uh, getting consumers to pay for the things that, that, that they value, uh, and they're paying uh, additional uh, uh, costs when they want to do something that costs the grid additional money. So, for example, um, I've got here the kind of comparison between the electric bill and the cable bill, moving from that kind of per kilowatt hour model to that kind of packaged bundled service offering. So, a future uh, market design could look something more like you pay for uh, for, for your house, or you, let, let's say you pay a fixed amount for power over a year, and they assume that you, your house is heated to within three degrees of where you say, and your car's charged in an eight hour window. And you can pay a premium to have a kind of sharper or, or, or narrower temperature range or a narrower charging window. So, nothing there maybe is that radical. I basically said cost reflective pricing and, uh, sorry, value reflective pricing and cost reflective charging. Nothing too radical, I hope. No, thank you for your affirmation, sir. That means a lot. Um, so why aren't we doing it yet? Um, well, it's because it's complex. There's a lot of moving parts here. I think there are kind of three key reasons. The first one is that missing markets piece I already touched on. We are not sending price signals for behavior we want. We haven't kind of carved out new, uh, these new markets yet. We're still kind of in these kind of opaque bilateral utility-centric service models where you sort of sign a one-way kind of uh, uh, opaque uh, agreement with this person in this region because you need their inertia or something like that. We've got to start calling out that value uh, in order to develop markets. The second one, uh, missing visibility of the capabilities of the system. Now, um, this goes some way to explain why some of these markets remain uh, uh, missing. The network operators and the system operators can't see all of the assets or the capabilities, uh, let's say the kind of flexible technologies and what have you, in their region. No one has a full view anymore. And behind the meter assets, like, forget about it. But the boundary of the grid has fundamentally moved now. You know, it used to stop at the meter. Now there's all this capability behind the meter. And we need to start seeing those uh, in order for people to start uh, uh, making flexible resources part of network planning and and pricing. And then there's the missing regulation piece, because we're in energy, uh, and, and there's a lot of uh, uh, regulation here. Essentially, you, it, you've got to design a kind of end-to-end -end system, and someone has to be looking out for whole system value. So you need to coordinate these markets. If you're going to let a single battery sell all those services at once, or even two at once, you need to require that those markets are coordinated. And those markets are often owned by different people. So I'm going to talk a bit about the approach that uh, my company, Electron, is taking to uh, move some of these forwards, because you kind of see at the, the, at the bottom this kind of confluence of energy, sorry, of economics, technology, and politics, where energy exists, uh, is a kind of amazing recipe for stasis. Um, 
But we've got to find ways. I mean, I mean, no future exchange is going to be successful unless they're able to kind of modularize the way we uh, develop this. Um, the markets that we're, we're sort of pricing or solving for today are not going to be the markets that we're pricing for when we've got 20% wind and solar penetration. And they're certainly not going to be the ones we've got with 50%. So you need this kind of modular approach. Um, and you need to leverage all sorts of new technology um, in order to create these new coordination uh, um, models. So number one, addressing missing markets. The kind of key thing here is address current pain points. Um, there's an awful lot of pain points that already exist. A great example of this, or my favorite example of this, is the containment market. Um, this is a market we're actually taking live at the end of the year uh, in one of the regions in the UK. Um, huge pain point, right? Curtailment basically means if there's not enough network capacity to take all the generation, then you just get curtailed or cut off. You're not allowed to export. And we do it on a last-in, first-out basis. So you've got a whole bunch of you know, renewable generation in the region we're working in. is 160% renewable penetration. And the renewables are getting cut off the system whenever there's too much wind. We're creating a market where it's a kind of B2B market. The, the, the generator can pay a generator with a lower marginal cost. Let's say uh, wind can pay gas for their right to export in that period and keep the difference in their, in their margins. Uh, or you can pay uh, the demand side to turn up. You know, we're starting in a region with no uh, gas grid, so there's a huge amount of flexible uh, heat to play there. And there's other exciting ones, um, capacity markets. Um, you don't just need uh, grid operators to do this. It's like secondary markets, right? Um, peak shaving is a project we're working on with a Canadian utility here. Um, local constraints, all sorts of things, you know, lo uh, local stability, all sorts of things. You've got to, got to, got to learn by doing. There is no substitute for it. We've got to start in the areas of high penetration and try and work out what the uh, um, price signals are and ask the market what the value is to them. So define market rules and define market relationships. So when you've built a number of these markets, you get to talk about what that market means for another market. If you're uh, uh, in the capacity market, you can't trade into curtailment because you've already promised to deliver capacity to someone else, for example. Um, so that can be done in a modular way. Then addressing asset visibility. This is the kind of key to scaling those markets. Um, you've got so, so nomenclature. You've got to align local and national nom nom nomenclature. I can't even say it. So if uh, the system operator is calling a, a, an asset by a different name to the local uh, distribution company, uh, that's a problem. That They're not going to be able to trade those assets together. And they're just going to exclude the assets from the market and say, look, we don't know what they're doing. Unless you get, an, an, uh, unless you get that visibility and that kind of alignment correct from a kind of structural level, people aren't going to allow you to take those trials that I showed you on the previous page mainstream. But this is a very difficult challenge, right? Because in the energy space, those data sets are all owned by different people. A lot of them are owned by uh, monopolies who have a kind of uh, a regulatory requirement to keep owning those data sets, even though they're kind of overlapping and disparate for another 30 years. So here we go. So and, 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 and then you've got all sorts of new uh, uh, people with kind of new relevant data, you know, service providers with operational data. You've got equipment manufacturers with capability data. You've also got to kind of bring into this fold. So we are doing a, a project on this in the UK uh, where we're basically creating a single point of data access without requiring uh, uh, a single operator of that data. You've essentially got multiple data stewards. It's a bit like a decentralized Facebook. We use blockchain for this. You know when you sign into Facebook to essentially give your data to some new website? Uh, it's essentially that. It's basically creating a single portal where you can grant permission to access uh, 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 data about your assets. Um, and and uh, essentially, um, you get a data report uh, on blockchain of who granted who access permission, under what conditions, the kind of smart contracts, and a list of who's accessed or, or, or used those data viewing rights. Um, that's essentially how we can create this kind of single data cat catalog. So the index piece is the asset ID, but keep allowing all those different people to own that data around it. So this is where the magic happens. It's when you start bringing those two pieces together. On the one hand, you've got the data sets. And on that other hand, you've got all these kind of uh, markets that you're trying to bring together. So single name for a single asset through the uh, data catalog then allows the operators of those assets to sign them up to uh, individual markets. Essentially, um, 
the market rules have been coordinated in as much as it's, it's, it's actually much simpler than it sounds. It's, it's only the rules around who can uh, enter a market, who can leave a market, and which assets are qualified to be in that market. So essentially, you allow people to take control of their own asset ID, correct it if the data is wrong, because decentralized data correction is much, much more uh, appropriate or, or, or efficient than centralized, um, and, and, and essentially use that ownership of that ID to sign up to all these different markets. And the markets can check uh, how those uh, 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 different um, activities that asset is committed to work together. This is the kind of uh, approach that we think enables a single, let's say, battery to play across multiple markets, and yet to keep the assurance at the kind of uh, system or network operator level that none of the rules of the system are being uh, contravened. So that's the kind of exchange for uh, flexibility. I haven't really talked about the service market, whereas I started here saying we should move to a kind of consumer service model. It's not just markets that uh, uh, asset operators can sign up to, it's also services. So let's say someone's got a great trading algorithm for this type of battery uh, in this kind of household. You can then essentially sign your uh, a, a battery up to be traded with them. The trader is the agent. Um, you, know, you, can, you can do it in a kind of time-bound, uh, transparent way. Uh, let's say someone wants to ensure uh, certain assets who are qualified in one of these three markets. You can essentially sign your asset up to that insurance policy, and the insurer, or the person who sort of created that insurance market, can check that you are actually qualified to be in the markets that you say you're qualified for. So this gives you a, a very modular, kind of extensible approach, and doesn't lose sight of the kind of end-to-end -end coordination system. Let's see if I've got anything else. Okay, great. Um, so, so kind of in conclusion, kind of how we can start moving this world along. The market design, current market design, is in the way of the energy transition. It's still entirely designed for thermal, flexible generation, and it needs a rethink if we're going to move to a higher penetration of renewables. Um, there are markets, or, or, or there are places in which we can start addressing it today, and we really, really need to. So this is a kind of partnership model, learn by doing. Um, but ultimately, coordination or, or having that view of whole system requirements is going to make those markets maximum, or it's going to maximize the value of those markets and services to consumers. Thanks very much.